Hi everyone, welcome to Party Like a Marketer, the podcast dedicated to cannabis marketing, public relations, and authentic storytelling. I'm your host, Lisa Buffo, founder and CEO of Cannabis Marketing Association. You can connect with me on LinkedIn, Instagram, at LeeBuff, and Twitter at LeeBuff21. Send me a message, I'd love to hear from you. Party Like a Marketer guests are CMA members. Enjoy free access to our twice a month workshops and online educational series. Get cannabis marketing resources on our online member portal and ask questions and connect with your peers in the CMA Slack. You'll also get exclusive cannabis marketing content directly to your inbox. Join today at thecannabismarketingassociation.com. Today's conversation features Shauna Selden McGregor, the founder and CEO of Maverick Public Relations. Shauna established Maverick PR in 2018 after two decades of building communications agencies in New York City and Denver. Shauna has deep experience representing a multitude of sectors, including biotech, agribusiness, sustainable technologies, renewable energy, associations, the cannabis industry, and media companies. Shauna is a member of the Crisis Ready Institute, a Newsweek Expert Forum, NIRI, NCIA, Cannabis Doing Good, and the Cannabis Marketing Association. She's also a member of PRSA, where she serves on the Colorado Chapter's DEI Committee and has earned a Certificate in Reputation Management. She also received a Certificate in Crisis Communications and was named a top PR pro by Green Market Report, MG Magazine, Civilized, and Cannabis Industry Journal. Shana, thank you so much for joining us today. Lisa, thank you. It's an honor to be on the show and to be asked. Thanks for having me. Yes. So you have been deep in cannabis PR in the industry, and I've known you through the Colorado community for quite some time now. Can you tell the audience a little bit about your career, how you got started in PR, your background, and as well as how you got started in cannabis and what that path has been for you? Yeah. So I have just long story way shorter, have always wanted to be a publicist since day one. I started my career in 1998 in New York City at a at um, an agency at a really big, you know, top five agency. And I was doing PR for healthcare and knew I wanted to felt kind of like a cog in a wheel and wanted to um, be more the wheel <laughs> in the car. And so I moved to a boutique agency in New York City and I was there for almost 20 years. And in in that time frame, um, um I happened to meet a guy who wanted to move back to where he was from, which happened to be Denver, Colorado. And we happened to land in Denver, Colorado in June of 2012. I am sadly and admittedly a political junkie. So we immediately went to register to vote. And when we saw the ballot measure amendment 64, I was pretty sure I had died and gone to heaven because when I lived in New York city, we were, um, you know, we had our guy and, you know, all of that. And, um, I've been consuming cannabis since before I should admit I've been a big fan but I'm a nerd. I worked, um, I kind of, my background was doing PR for media companies, which is a very interesting place to be. So the timings and the, you know, the Merediths of the world and um, getting our editors onto those morning shows or um, authors onto, you know, the nightly news and stuff like that. So had a lot of experience on not only what editors were looking for, but also what um, the producers wanted as well. Um, And so was, you know, here, just thought it was cool that I had no idea how far the West had progressed in, um, in cannabis legal regulate regulation and legalization. And by 2014, I had um, my, partner um in crime I guess that's probably not the best way to phrase it but what but just someone who I am I had been working with Stan Wagner I had been working with him in 
the sustainable um, construction um, AEC space kind of lean over to me and say, you know, what do you think about cannabis? And, and he needed help with some events he was putting on and I jumped right in and this was 20 March of 2014 and in Denver, Colorado. And so many business owners had put their blood, sweat and tears into their businesses, but they were afraid to be like the tall poppy. And the minute, you know, we kind of um, I asked them, you know, said, let's educate these publics through these channels of the media in a way, you know, if you're, if you are a company that is compliant, uh, transparent, you have nothing to hide, the state has approved it, let's start educating the, the media, and um, they were in, you know, it, it was, they were very, the press really wanted to be educated on what was going on. So that was a lot of fun. And it kind of spiraled or skyrocketed um, from there. And in 2018, I always knew I wanted to do my own thing, kind of my own way. <laughs> and so I launched Maverick Public Relations in 2018. And here we are. Nice. So, so that means you were, so 2014 was when you had first started as far as doing PR in cannabis in Colorado. So that was the first year of adult use. And really the, the I, I remember that I was there as well. There was lots of eyes on Colorado and Washington and Oregon at the time, locally, nationally, internationally, because everyone wanted to, wanted to see, you know, how this was going to work and how it was going to play out. So you must've had a really good um, view on that just even within the small Denver community. Yes, definitely in terms of, well, the whole thing is, is it was one of those unique moments of time with, you know, that every publicist dreams about. Well, I mean, that's our job, right? Like we need to be part of the news. And like, if we could take a step back, you know, public relations and communications and earned media falls under the marketing umbrella. And they're very discreet and different pillars under marketing. And what I do is very discreet. It's very specific. It is not paid media. I don't do paid media plans and I don't do a lot of the you know, marketing tech stuff that, <laughs> that you guys, you know, that the rest of the marketers do. I sit in a very interesting and, and, and defined place of, of, um, of communications and earned media, which is looking for the news and helping clients who may not fully grasp that every journalist is, you know, not out to get, you know, put through the 60 minute, you know, hatchet job on them or something. And also bring the journalists and the client together. So I want to be able to help my, my clients understand that journalists aren't anyone to anything to be afraid of. And they often have this fear that they're going to be in an expose or exposed. So helping them understand the press and helping the press get access to them is, is what my job is. That makes sense. And I really like what you said about being afraid of being the tall poppy, because I think that is something that um, is true for a lot of businesses, definitely then. And I still think today where they think, oh, if I'm too um, out there, too public, I'm putting a target on my back in, in some ways. Um, and there's a lot of different angles you can look at that. But earned media is a really powerful way. We So at Cannabis Marketing Association, we talk about compliance and regulations all the time. And one of the very cool things about earned media is that's all free speech, right? You can, you can speak with journalists and that gives brands a level of credibility with the public. And it does serve a very important role because it informs that discourse. So that being said, we, we talk a lot about um, the, the toolkit, using the tools that you've got, whether you're a small business or a large business, there are different tools you can use to help your marketing and communications presence. Can can you speak a little bit to um, the PR, earned media 
arm of that toolkit and um, the the value in it. Like, I, I know it sounds so obvious, but like the publicist yeah. point of view and the value in it and just bridging that gap for our audience. Absolutely. Because it seems obvious to me and you, and I do this all the time. I'm like, what? You can't read my mind. You yeah. know? <laughs> but it really is something that it, a small to mid-sized company may not fully comprehend. And like the biggest challenge that I have had from the beginning of my career until now and until the end of my career um, is ex- with business owners, helping them understand, again, the discrete difference between marketing and the what falls under it, paid media and earned media. And so with earned media, you, with paid media, you control everything soup to nuts, right? Like you control what it looks like, what the co- color of the ad is, what the message says, even so much today now with the disruption of the press and of journalism, even, you know, the sponsored content pieces you have complete control of. But if you want true earned media thought leadership, you can, you have to come in with service. It's all about providing service or education around something that's happening. So whether it is, you know, top tips for small businesses and PR, you know, or, you know, top tips for small businesses to, um, you know, leverage public relations, or it is, you know, the city council had a um, resolution yesterday to, um, you know, be against something or another about cannabis, you know, you have to be able to get into that news cycle. It is not a controlled message. It is a service message. Um, yeah. So, yeah. So like, you know, so for those folks out there that are the, you know, the directors of marketing or, you know, the directors of communication at their company, when a press person calls, like, you know, you'll, you'll have your stakeholders list in whatever, you know, way that you have it, you have, you know, your internal stakeholders, you have your staff and you have, you know, maybe you have an investor stakeholder piece, but you also need to have this channel, this, this journalist um, stakeholders list. And when press reaches out to you, um, you know, treat them as you would any person and and ask them what they need what kind of deadline how can you help and you know answer their questions transparently and honestly and and keep keep a record of that because educating these folks and taking them on a tour of your facility or you know giving them a tour of your dispensary will um help them understand the industry. It's not scary. It's, you know, very similar to a liquor store or something like that. And um, then when they have questions, they can come back to you as an industry um, voice. And you can tell that side because right now we are, it's October 12th and we are less than a month away from midterms. And, you know, if 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 you only just let so my head is always on you know the opposition what is the opposition saying and if you just let the opposition tell your story um then you lose so i'm always whenever a client is like why do we want to get into this and i have to push back i'm i always say if you do not tell your story you're letting someone else tell your story so how do we tell your story for you I love that because we, I always say that good marketing is good storytelling and it's, it's not necessarily about the flashiest ad or the best brand book in colors. It's the way you tell your story, which is often a multi-channel strategy, whether it's your own website, your social media, earned media, paid ads, all of that adds up to your story, but earned media is the place where I think a lot of trust can be built because you inherently, the journalist is is telling the story based on what you told them. So if you're able to communicate with them and educate in a way, and they're able to write about it, it's going to inform that story as far as what you're saying, but also what's the bigger picture and what's the narrative around the industry or 
you know, the upcoming election or whatever is coming up. So it is important to have um, those voices at the table, particularly of your clients and cannabis businesses and those experts who have been doing this and can speak to it from a really unique point of view. So I love that angle of telling it that viewing it as your story to tell and, and, and just framing it that way. It's not necessarily like a, a place that's scary. It's you do get to control what you say to them. Um, the rest of the story, you know, is, is on them, but it is important to be able to get your voice out there and it can prove, I want to add a note about how it does factor into a, like a multi-channel, uh, marketing strategy. We talk about SEO a lot on the podcast and, um, search. And when you've got links to valuable, credible resources published online, say you get in Forbes or the Denver business journal, Google values that as they see it as valuable and it can boost your search engine rankings just for your website. So there is this like thread with PR and earned media where you get to tell your story. It's that tool in the toolkit, but it also can kind of factor into, um, bringing eyeballs and visibility and that top of funnel credibility and awareness to your website and your brand in a way that a paid ad doesn't translate as much because they people see that and they know that's coming from you. Heck yeah. Um, and I'm the whole SEO conversation. I am not an expert, but I have a lot of questions because I see all of these you know, this is definitely a topic for another. I'm just going to plant a little seed here. Um, but, you know, I see all of these companies selling sponsored content and they're writing garbage and it's in links that they won't see, but they're selling these backlink authority stuff. And I kind of think it's garbage because, you know, I, you know, my clients will draft a thoughtful, non-AI, you know, coming from a human column that can go into any of before said um outlets and truly be meaningful and actually see eyeballs and so there's like a little bit of a, you know <laughs> like I, there's a little bit of um, a question mark there but i have seen it work with seo when you tell your story truthfully and transparently and with integrity but I want to just also state that even before the story, like, let's, you know, let's, let, let's be honest here. You need a good product that Correct. works. Yes. You know, it all starts like, like you said, you, you caught my ear with this and I just have to put a point on it. You can have the most beautiful packaging and the most beautiful brand book, like gorgeous, polished, whatever. And if I'm consuming your product and it doesn't work then I'm never going to buy it again. And believe me, I consume a lot of cannabis and I've tried a lot of products and there are beautiful ones that I gravitate to and try once and never again. So start with a good product, good authenticity, good um, values, your heart and your soul and your soul, and you'll win the hearts and souls and of others too. So um, by telling and sharing your story. That is correct. And thank you for emphasizing that because it's not... Um... You can't leverage PR or really any of these marketing tools as like, what's the phrase, putting lipstick on a pig? Like it doesn't work like that. It does have to be very clear and valuable. And then you use these things to take you to the next level. But they're definitely got to have that base foundation of a, a good business, good product that consumers want. And then these things can take, take you up. Um, well, let me be clear before we move on from that point. Absolutely. And I will not work with a questionable company, like a company that has a questionable product or something like that. You know, part of what we talked about is providing tips maybe to the next generation or to some some of the, you know, folks that are kind of coming up in this industry. And, you know, I always think back to my professor, PR professor 101, day one, you know, class one, and he said, you always have to be ready to walk away. Um, this, you know, communications and public relations, again, I can't stress it enough. It's authenticity, transparency, and honesty. And if the client cannot provide those things, then I cannot be a part of it. It's as simple as that. Yeah, that makes sense. Cause it's your reputation on the line as well. 
And so, yeah, also just to put a point on PR, this is not something I cannot buy. I cannot pay you for this time. Like I cannot, you know, pay a reporter from whatever organization for their time. They respect me because they know that I'm going to do the best I can to get them the very best, best voices that are going to be honest and truthful and tell them everything that they can. So that is my job. That is my North star. And, um, that is what I do. I don't try to be everything for everyone. I try to be a storyteller and try to be an educator. That makes sense. So I, I want to talk about those top tips for businesses. So for those who may, um, be early considering hiring a publicist or maybe starting to do it on their own, what are some of your first tips and steps that you say you would give to business owners? Yeah. So some of these tips may be things that they have already done, but let's just start at the top, right? You know, determine your target audience is, you know, and, and your target channels, so, um, you know, understanding who you want to reach. Um, and then um, if you are, again, sort of doing this um, all in-house, you're going to want to start to have a press list and you're going to want to look and see who is telling the stories of your competitive set and make sure that they know about you, introduce yourself, invite them to a tour, you know, that sort of thing. Um you know, and be, um, you know, and be responsive to them because, you know, if they reach out to you and want comment on a story, understand, you know, one of the first questions I try to drill into myself and everyone else is ask them what their deadline is and meet their deadline. So, you know, just keeping a record of the journalists that are reporting on your sector, on your space, on your competitive set, and making sure that they, and having regular touch points with them in communications that is meaningful. Like, so, but if you have an issue that, or a statement or a response to something that is happening either, um, you know, politically or, business wise or whatever the case might be share that with the with the reporters that you have been you know tracking and and start that relationship and and just be responsive to them those would be um if if you know if you want uh, those would be my start building blocks on a bigger program yeah and i think um a lot of folks so when when i first started cma we did all all of our own pr um and even my own like before I started this and was working in marketing for other companies, same, same thing. So for a lot of folks with small teams, um, one tip I want to add in there is like, you can reach out first too and let, let them know who you are. Like follow those journalists on Twitter, start a Twitter list and say cannabis journalists and then, and listen, and if they are writing something that's really awesome or is right in your wheelhouse, you can reach out and say, Hey, you know, Shauna, journalist for the Boulder Daily Camera, thank you so much for writing about cannabis in my community. I really appreciated it. If you need, um, you know, insight next time you write about it, don't hesitate to reach out. Here's my contact information. So I think entrepreneurs and marketers can, um, it's, it's a two-way thing and they can be proactive about it as well. And then that way they're putting themselves out there so that when these opportunities come up or a ballot measure, you know, is, is put up, they say reporters will also have you on their list. So there's there. So it works both ways in this, in that sense where you're building a relationship, just like you would any other professional relationship. And it involves respecting their time, respecting, you know, the job that they're doing and trying to meet them at least halfway, if not more, as far as being able to, to deliver that service and value so that down the line, um, you are their go-to resource or they they can call you and know like, okay, if I call Lisa, she's gonna, she'll know what to say about cannabis marketing. And it's a, it's a long-term strategy that starts with these small building blocks. So I do want, yeah, I definitely put a point on follow them on, like Twitter is the only reason I'm still on Twitter is because journalists are, and you can see what they're thinking, what they're reporting, how, what they um, are asking about. So, you know, Twitter, I, I follow 
as many journalists as I can on Twitter, linking in with them and that sort of thing. And then also, um, you know, if you care about journalism, subscribe to these outlets. Gosh darn it. Like some of them are not really, you know, like make a commitment. I'm subscribed to every, like, oh, every outlet I pitch. I subscribe and I get it digitally or a ton of print stuff. Subscribe to journalism, please, you know, folks, like, you know, subscribe to the outlets you care about, whether it's, you know, I'm in Denver, so whether it's the Denver Business Journal or, you know, Denver Post or it's, or it's Bloomberg or it's Business Insider, like, you know, subscribe um, and follow them on social too. <laughs> That's a good point. That's a very good point. Some of my, yeah, I subscribe. I love the New York Times, like being able to see that and stay up to date um, with not just what's going on in your sector, your industry, but also what's the, what is it in context to the broader narrative of what's happening in our world in current events or whatever that, um, you know, like whatever their wheelhouse is specifically can be really helpful to you as a business owner as well to be able to take in that information and follow trends and and what's going on from reputable reporters who are doing their job and not just delivering you paid um, content at, that you see in some other publications. So that is definitely a really good point. Um, what is one thing that when you start working with clients that you feel like you either wish they knew or you spend time educating them on when it comes to PR and earned media? Like if you had a piece of advice for um, business owners or entrepreneurs who are getting started in this space, like what would that be? We kind of touched on it, but it cannot be repeated enough. PR is not advertising. Um, your my, so your paid media message is completely different from your PR and your earned media message, and that is the number one education and the thing that I have to explain the most. Also, lead time. I mean, I always want to start a relationship with, with the rubber hitting the road, and I want to be getting lots of awesome hits for my clients. But the bigger ones, the more the bigger outlets that might have, you know, might be building off of a trend story or something, it could take time. So I can start on on month one, day one, and I can, you know, start pitching and I can start to build some of the, you know, some of the education and, and the coverage around a client. But if for really those big pieces, you know, it could take six months or a year to get into a, a New York Times or a Wall Street Journal or something like that. You have to have, it is, um, not a timeline that there's any control over. And that can be scary and confusing to a client who's paying a lot of money every month for a retainer. Like, what exactly are you doing? So I try to be as transparent as possible to how we're doing it and what the process is and how much time we're spending, whether it's like developing a strategy or, you know, who we're pitching and how we're pitching it and what we're hearing back on it. And also the other, you know, and the secondary piece of that is that, you know, not everything is a PR pitch. <laughs> Back in the beginning, in 2014, sure. everything was a PR pitch because this was a new industry. Um, you know, new SKUs just might not be that interesting anymore, you know, so they're great for a marketing message, but they might not be the best use of a publicist's time, someone working on the earned media. A trend with new products, like looking at dissolvables or looking at, you know, edibles or gummies or, or vapes or whatever might be interesting, but it's harder and harder because that's not new news anymore. So what is the new news? Like, what are the innovations? What is pushing the industry? What is actual real news? That makes sense. So can you just touch on that a little bit? Like, so when you were working with the client and forming a strategy, like what are those steps to your marketing strategy to or your PR strategy? Like, how do you put that together? And what are some of the questions that you need to consider? Okay, so um, I want to think of a, a good example to share, you know. Um, so if 
if you have a new dispensary launching, um, you know, you can do the the um, chamber, ribbon cutting, whatever, but you could, but really a PR plan is like, okay, who is this community? What do they need? What is the message around this? And like listening and understanding what the community needs. And then with a grand opening, maybe it's a local artist doing a mural on the dispensary's wall, or maybe it's a uh, register to vote you know, you know, pop up that's at the dispensary that you can invite the press to. So like, you've got this new dispensary in this community, adding value, adding worth, and you've got some community driven pieces to it that are actually newsworthy. And it's not just, oh, another dispensary opening because here in Denver, there's more dispensaries than there are Starbucks. And I think McDonald's put together, but you'll have to fact check me on that one. But, um, you know, so you have to actually make it a community driven message. I love that. So it's, it's, um, how you are integrating with the community and what does that value add? Because you are selling to a buyer persona, whichever way you want to look at that, but by tying your values and your mission and what your company is about, into more than just your products, but what are, what are you providing to the community and how are you in bringing them into that conversation? So I love that thought process. It's not always about, you know, we hear a lot about, oh, we got this new cool growing technique or this proprietary, you know, way to make distillate. And it's like, but, but that is part of it, but it's also what are you bringing to that community? So I love that um, thought and emphasis about it, that were just end to end relationship and how PR and earned media can be that lever in the middle. And don't get me wrong. Those innovation pieces are very interesting and could potentially be stand on their own as newsworthy, but are they really innovative? Like, you know, there's a lot of folks who's like, this is new and different and no one has done it. And then you, if you scratch the surface, maybe it's not. But when you truly have this new and innovative process, there's a place for that. And there's a channel for that. And there's reporters that are going to be interested in that in a certain way. But it's going to be very different from like, you know, boots on the ground wanting to get people through the door of a, you know, to purchase product. So, you know, who, what is the client? What are their goals? So yeah, you were saying like, what are the steps? what is the client? Are they retail? Are they brand? Are they, you know, whatever the case might be. And I mostly work with leaf touching um, companies. So, and then who are we trying to, um, who are we trying to educate? So, and what are those channels to reach those? And so thinking about it in that way too. Um, And some of that might be, there's a unique, delivery option method of a certain, you know, product, but really speaking to community, I think it's going to get you a lot better, more good, well, and um, understanding. And you said, correct me if I'm wrong, but you said you had spent 20 years at a boutique agency. Was that healthcare as well? No. So at the 20 years um, at the Rosen Group in New York City, Um, was that where I really focused on um, uh, media. So it's, you know, I was mostly representing media organizations. And through that work, you know, I started meeting different interesting people. And I started representing, so I went from like core representing media outlets, such as you know, Smithsonian Magazine or AARP, the magazine, or that sort of thing to moving into associations that were very DC based. So the American Wind Energy Association, which had conferences of 20,000 plus attendees and stuff like in handling the press for that. And so in, you know, and then moving from New York City to Denver to open an office for the Rosen Group and um, build out that company build out that office here. So do you see, can you speak to any of, if there are any differences in the uh, earned media landscape or the way you approach what you do from healthcare and media slash associations to cannabis? Like, is there anything unique about cannabis that you're like, wow, I 
I wish I knew this when I worked in, in media, like this is different or is it really, um, or not? Like, is like, what's the, how does it differ and where is it the same? I think that most communication tactics are fairly transferable, particularly the knowledge I got um, when I was at Porter Novelli in their healthcare department in 1998, that, that experience and knowledge was so um, helpful in what I do today because we were, um, you know, representing pharmaceutical companies and we were telling patients stories to the press about the success that they had had on, you know, um, incontinence drugs or like herpes <laughs> medications or like all that fun stuff, you know, and now I get to talk about wheat. <laughs> um, but, you know, so being able to understand um, how to tell a story of a, of a medicine and a wellness product and what we need to think about and, and like the protections and the honor that we need to put around the patients and in the product as well. That was that was very transferable. Um, I the difference is, is that as we sit here again today, I'm going to date market October 12, twenty twenty two. Um, cannabis remains federally illegal, and there are news outlets that will not cover cannabis. I'm not going to name names. They know who they are. They are big publications and they won't cover cannabis in their edit, in their ed editorial spaces because of the fear. And that goes to print and then certainly to broadcast. I am furious. I am, you've seen it. Anyone can go on my LinkedIn page and read my Newsweek column. I am furious that gambling apps are able to sponsor a college stadium when cannabis cannot even get an a broadcast ad on you know on network tv to me it just blows my mind and i guess the gambling apps have better lobbyists i'm not sure what to say there but it's you know shocking to me so i think the biggest that and i I moved into paid media, but, you know, the whole earned piece of it is that, you know, a lot of, of bigger um, outlets, they've either kind of, they're like, oh, we covered the launch and now the shininess is kind of off. Yeah. Um, and what really is the next step? And, and it will, and the FCC has a big role to play in this as well. And so, you know, um, I think that that is the biggest challenge the other big piece of this is more and more and more and more like i'm I, um don't get me wrong i use wire new york times wire cutter to figure out what kind of like you know everything i'm gonna get from my humid my humidifier to like whatever but those are all affiliate programs and these days you can't it is very difficult if not virtually impossible to get a product into a roundup if you are not on an affiliate platform. So, and affiliate platforms will not take THC plant touching products. So that is, you know, they might take the, you know, the, the peaks or peaks or, you know, the, the different, um, uh, um, sorry, I'm <laughs> like the different, you know, uh, ancillary products of, of the space. But, you know, I think that that puts us at, in a big disadvantage as well. Yeah, it does. It definitely does. I think, uh, I mean, you're right. There's only so much we see it in every corner of this industry, um, from media to marketing to physical operations. As long as cannabis remains federally unlawful, there's going to be restrictions that change the way in which all aspects of, of business are done that is unfortunately something we have to deal with for now, but um, to a degree it's led to some creativity and innovation as far as how we reach people and get our message across. But I think that also does speak to the power of earned media even more because that is available to you um, for the publications that are covering it and will take it and are there and, and willing to listen. 
Um, so before we wrap up, I, we've got a few minutes left. I want to ask one or two last questions. Um, one being, what would be your piece of advice to young professionals who are looking to get into uh, become a cannabis publicist or get into cannabis PR? Um, so PR, true PR is not a nine to five job. Um, you know, no, if, if you want a nine to five job, you might want to look somewhere else, <laughs> but, um, you know, I think that meet everyone you can understand that understand this is not a black and white world that we live in. There um, are good fits and bad fits, um, you know, of places to work. And I, I think meeting with anyone and everyone you can and getting your foot in the door and trying um, and working with a lot of different um, folks is very valuable. And, um, you know, say yes, but also start to think about and, and you know, understand and, and start to think about your boundaries. I can't believe I've made it through an entire podcast without mentioning Brene Brown, but you yeah. know, like, you know, I think Good. that if you're yeah. a, <laughs> if you're a young communicator, um, her new book, Atlas of the Heart, I think is a great way to understand, um, emotions and communications. And that is, you know, a, a community, a connection-based book, but it is so relevant to what we do um, that, um, you know, I think I, I think just absorbing, listening to podcasts like this and um, meeting as many people as you can and trying a lot of different experiences. I love that. Thank you for that piece of advice. That that's a uh, and that's a great book. I'm going to echo that as well. Anything Brene Brown, I am like pre-order. So that one She's is a spirit animal. <laughs> amazing. She's incredible. Okay, Shauna, what would be last question then? Just one last piece of advice or tips you would give to cannabis um, marketers, brands, retailers about PR and earned media, if there was one takeaway, what would that be? Or what piece of advice would you give? Um, tell, be authentic, transparent, and honest. Always. If you lead with that, you can't lose. Love it. Shauna, thank you so much. Do you have any contact information, website, or social media you want to share with the audience? We'll li link it in the podcast description as well. But how can our readers our readers, our listeners find you. Yeah. Um, our website is the maverick PR.com and we're pretty active on LinkedIn and Instagram and we have a Facebook page. Um, and you can reach me, um, on LinkedIn. Um, and all my information is on the website too. My <laughs> phone number and email is everywhere. So if you have questions, give me a call. I'm always happy to chat. Thank you, Shauna. I really appreciate you taking the time to join us today on the podcast. Lisa, thank you so much. And I can't wait to see you again. Of course. Thank you. Bye. Thank you for joining us for another episode of Party Like a Marketer. Follow us on Instagram at Party Like a Marketer and on our website, thecannabismarketingassociation.com. Check out our website for more details and membership information. We'll see you next time.